Welcome to Love and Money Secrets TV. I'm your host, Dame Lillian Walker. Today we are starting chapter three of breaking the habit of becoming yourself. So let's get started, dive in deep here. Chapter three, overcoming your body. You do not think in a vacuum. Every time you have a thought, there is a biochemical reaction in the brain and you make a chemical. And as you'll learn, the brain then releases specific chemical signals to the body where they act as messengers of thought. When the body gets these chemical messages from the brain, it complies instantly by initiating a matching set of reactions directly in alignment with that in the brain, whatever it is that the brain is thinking. So then the body immediately sends a conforming message to back up the brain that it, it's now feeling exactly the way the brain is thinking. So to understand this process, how you typically think equal to your body and how to form a new mind, you first need to appreciate the role of the brain and its chemistry and how the chemistry plays in your life. So in the last few decades, we've discovered that the brain and the rest of the body interact via powerful electromagnetic signals. There is an extensive chemical factory between our ears that orchestrates a myriad of the bodily functions. But relax, this is going to be brain chemistry 101. And a few terms are all that you need to know. So all the cells have receptor sites on their exterior surface that receive information from outside their boundaries. So when there's a match in chemistry, frequency, and an electrical charge between a receptor site and an incoming signal from the outside, the cell gets turned on so to the performing certain tasks. So if you look in your books, for those of you who have your books, Look at figure 3A, and we are on page, for those of you who are curious what page we are on, we are actually on page 54. So if you look at figure 3A, a cell with a receptor site, there's a diagram, and there's a cell with the receptor sites that, that are receiving vital incoming information from the outside of the cell. The signal can influence the cell to perform a myriad of biological functions neurotransmitters, neuropeptides, and hormones are the cause and effect chemicals for the brain's activity and bodily functioning. These three different types of chemicals called ligands, the word ligare means to bind in Latin, connect to, interact with, or influence the cell in a matter of just milliseconds. Neurotransmitters are chemical messengers that primarily send signals between nerve cells, allowing the brain and nervous system to communicate. There are different types of neurotransmitters and each is responsible for a particular activity. Some excite the brain, others slow it down while still others make us sleepy or awake. They can tell a neuron to unhook from its current connection or make it stick better to its present connection. They can even change the message as it is being sent to a neuron, rewriting it so that a different message is delivered to all the connected nerve cells. Neuropeptides, the second type of ligand, make up a majority of these messengers. Most are manufactured in the structure of the brain called the hypothalamus. Recent studies show that our immune system also makes them. These chemicals are passed through the pituitary gland, which then releases a chemical message to the body with specific instructions. As neuropeptides make their way through the bloodstream, they attach to the cells of various tissues, primarily glands. 
and then turn on the third type of ligand, hormones, which further influence us to feel certain ways. Neuropeptides and hormones are the chemicals responsible for our feelings. For our purposes, think of neurotransmitters as chemical messengers primarily from the brain and mind, neuropeptides as chemical engineers and signalers that serve as a bridge between the brain and the body to make us feel the way we are thinking and hormones as the chemicals related to feelings primarily in the body. So if you look at figure 3B, you're going to see neurotransmitters are diverse chemical messengers between neurons. Neuropeptides are chemical couriers that signal different glands of the body to make hormones. So for example, when you have a sexual fantasy, all three of these factors are called to action. First, as you start to think a few thoughts, your brain whips up neurotransmitters that turn on a network of neurons which creates pictures in your mind. These chemicals then stimulate the release of specific neuropeptides into your bloodstream. So once they reach your sexual glands, those peptides bind to the cells of those tissues. They turn on your hormonal system and presto, things start to happen. You've made your fantasy thoughts so real in your mind that your body starts to get prepared for an actual sexual experience ahead of the event. That's how powerful and how powerfully mind and body are related. By the same means, if you start to think about confronting your teenager over the new dent in the car, your neurotransmitters would start the thought process in your brain to produce a specific level of mind. Your neuropeptides would chemically signal your body in a specific way, and you would begin to feel a bit riled up. As the peptides find their way to your adrenal glands, they would then be prompted to release the hormones adrenaline and cortisol. And now you are definitely feeling fired up. Chemically, your body is ready for battle. The thinking and feeling loop. As you think different thoughts, your brain circuits fire in corresponding sequence patterns and combinations, which then produce levels of mind equal to those thoughts. Once these specific networks of neurons are activated, the brain produces specific chemicals with the exact signature to match those thoughts so that you can feel the way you were just thinking. Therefore, when you have great thoughts or loving thoughts or joyous thoughts, you produce chemicals that make you feel great or loving or joyful. The same holds true if you have negative, fearful, or impatient thoughts. In a matter of seconds, you begin to feel negative or anxious or impatient. There's a certain synchronicity that takes place moment by moment between the brain and the body. In fact, as we begin to feel the way we are thinking, because the brain is in constant communication with the body, we begin to think the way we are feeling. The brain constantly monitors the way the body is feeling and based on the chemical feedback it receives, it will generate more thoughts and produce more chemicals corresponding to the way the body is feeling so that we first begin to feel the way we think and then to think the way we feel. So check out figure 3C, the neurochemical relationship between the brain and the body. As you think certain thoughts, the brain produces chemicals that cause you to feel exactly the way you were thinking. Once you feel the way you think, you begin to think the way you feel. This continuous cycle creates a feedback loop called a state of being. We will delve deeper into this idea throughout the book, but consider the thoughts that are primarily related to the mind and the brain. And feelings are connected to the body. Therefore, as the feelings of the body align to thoughts from a particular state of mind, mind and body are now working together 
as one. So, and as you'll recall, when the mind and the body are in unison, the end product is called a state of being. We could also say that the process of continuously thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking creates a state of being, which produces effects on our reality. A state of being means we have become familiar with a mental emotional state, a way of thinking and a way of feeling, which has become an integral part of our self identity. And so we describe who we are by how we are thinking and thus feeling, our being in the present moment. I am angry, I am suffering, I am inspired, I am insecure, I am negative. But years of thinking certain thoughts and then feeling the same way and then thinking equal to those feelings, you know, the hamster in the wheel, creates a memorized state of being in which we can emphatically declare our I am statement as an absolute. That means we're now at the point when we define ourselves as this state of being. Our thoughts and feelings have merged. So for example, we say, I have always been lazy. I am an anxious person. I am typically uncertain of myself. I have worthiness issues. I am short tempered. Uh, I am short tempered and impatient. I am really not that smart and so forth and so forth and so forth. And those particular memorized feelings contribute to all our personality traits. So warning, when feelings become the means of thinking, or if we cannot think greater than how we feel, we can never change. To change is to think greater than how we feel. To change is to act greater than the familiar feelings of the memorized self. As a practical example, let's say you're driving to work this morning and you begin to think about the heated encounter you had a few days ago with your coworker. As you think the thoughts associated with that person and that particular experience, your brain starts releasing chemicals that circulate through your body very quickly you begin to feel exactly the way you were thinking and you probably become angry your body sends a message back to your brain saying yep i'm feeling really ticked off of course your brain which constantly communicates with the body and monitors its internal chemical order is influenced by the sudden change in the way you're feeling so as a result, you begin to think differently. The moment you begin to feel the way you think and you begin to think the way you feel, you unconsciously reinforce the same feeling by continuing to think angry and frustrated thoughts, which then make you feel more angry and frustrated. In effect, your, feeling, your feelings are actually controlling your thinking. So your body is now driving your mind. So as the cycle goes on, your angry thoughts produce more chemical signals to your body, which activate the adrenal chemicals associated with your angry feelings. Now you become enraged and aggressive. You feel flushed. Your stomach is twisted into a knot, your head pounds, and your muscles start to clench. All, as all of those heightened feelings flood the body, and change its physiology, this chemical cocktail fires up a set of circuits in the brain equal, well, it causes up, yeah, this chemical cocktail fires up a set of circuits in the brain causing you to think equal to those emotions. Now you're telling your associate off 10 different ways in the privacy of your own mind. You indignantly conjure up a litany of past events that validate your past and that validate your present upset. Brainstorming through a letter recounting all of those complaints you've always wanted to lodge in your mind, you've always forwarded it to your boss before you even arrive at work. You exit the car dazed and crazed and a breath away from homicidal. Hello, walking, talking model 
of an angry person. And all of this started with a single thought. In this moment, it seems impossible to think greater than you feel. And that's why it's so hard to change. So the result of this cyclic communication between your brain and your body is that you tend to react predictably to these kinds of situations. You create patterns of the same familiar thoughts and feelings, and you're, you unconsciously behave in automatic ways, and you are mired in these routines. This is how the chemical you functions. Does your mind control your body? Or does your body control your mind? Why is it so hard to change? Imagine that your mother loves to suffer. And through long observation, you unconsciously saw that this behavior pattern enabled her to get what she wanted in life. Let's also say that you've had a few tough experiences in your own life, which created quite a bit of suffering for you. Those memories still elicit an emotional reaction centered around a specific person at a particular place and at a certain time in your life. You've thought about the past often enough and somehow those memories are easy to recall, even automatic. So now imagine that for more than 20 years, you've practiced thinking and feeling, feeling and thinking about suffering. Actually, you no longer need to think about the past event to create the feeling. You can't seem to think or act any other way than how you always feel. You've memorized suffering by your recurrent thoughts and feelings, those related to that incident as well as other events in your life. Your thoughts about yourself and your life tend to be colored by the feelings of victimization and self-pity. Repeating the same thoughts and feelings you've courted for more than 20 years has conditioned your body to remember the feelings of suffering. Without much conscious thought, this seems so natural and normal now. It's who you are. And anytime you try to change anything about yourself, it's like the road turns back on you. You're right back to your old self. What most people don't know is that when they think about a highly charged emotional experience, they make the brain fire in the exact same sequence and patterns as before. They're firing and wiring their brains to the past by reinforcing those circuits into an ever more hardwired networks. They also duplicate the same chemicals in the brain and the body in varying degrees. And if they're experiencing the event again in that moment, those chemicals begin to train the body to further memorize that emotion. So both chemicals result results. I'm sorry, I tapped this and I lost my spot. Okay, both the chemical results of thinking and feeling, feeling and thinking, as well as the neurons firing and wiring together, condition the mind and the body into a finite set of automatic programs. We are capable of reliving a past event over and over, perhaps thousands of times in one lifetime. It is the unconscious pattern that trains the body to remember that emotional state equal to or better than the conscious mind does. When the body remembers better than the conscious mind, that is when the body is the mind, that's what's called a habit. Psychologists tell us that by the time we're in our mid thirties, our identity or personality will be completely formed. This means that for those of us over 35, we have memorized a select set of behaviors, attitudes, belief, emotional reactions, habit skills, associated memories, conditioned responses, and perceptions that are now subconsciously programmed within us. Those programs are running us because the body has become the mind. This means that we will think the same thoughts, feel the same feelings, react in identical waves, behave in the same manner, believe the same dogmas, and perceive reality in the same ways. About 95% of who we are by midlife is a series of subconscious programs that have become automatic. Driving a car, brushing our teeth, overeating when we're stressed, 
worrying about our future, judging our friends, complaining about our lives, blaming our parents, not believing in ourselves, and insisting on being chronically unhappy, just to name a few. So I'm gonna hit the pause button here before we go on to the next section here, because one of the things that we, um, that Abraham Hicks talks about is that we have to learn to pay the price of joy. That in order for us to manifest, for us to create our own reality, in order for us to mold the clay and to mold the energy so that we put into our vortex what it is that we want, you have to pay the price of joy. That's a roundabout way of saying what Dr. Joe is telling us. He's explained, explaining to us why we're addicted to our past thoughts, feelings, actions, and emotions. It's because neurochemically we've created these neurological pathways. We have 1300 neurotransmitters that have actually forged very deep grooves in our bodies. And we have, if we're over 35, as Dr. Joe says, we have over 20 years of programming, of feeling unworthy, of feeling, you know, being in a pity party, of suffering, of being sad, woe is me, nothing ever goes my way, you know, judging, criticizing, um, and getting into arguments with your siblings, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, yada, blah, 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 yada, yada, blah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, it's pretty much infinite. But that is what has been. It doesn't need to be what is or what will be. If you choose to think and to use your mind to think a greater thought than what has been, to go beyond your emotions, to go beyond your thoughts of the past, and you begin to now recondition your brain, you're becoming smarter because as Kandel said in his research study, when you learn something new, when you act, feel, and behave in a different manner, you are now firing and wiring 2,600 neural synapses. Now the neurochemicals, the thoughts, feelings, and emotions that are starting to get stored in your body are brand new. It uses your right brain instead of your left brain. You are actually more intelligent because instead of 1300 neurotransmitters and neural synapses, you are yet now using 2600. That's 2600. That's double the neural synapses. So now your brain is linking and syncing, firing and wiring together to create the now and the future that you want. And because the organ of the brain doesn't know time, it does not know the difference between the past, the present, and the future. It's accepting that information, that command. And when you envelop it with an elevated emotion of joy, of unconditional love in your heart, when you decide to embrace and broadcast that feeling of love, and then you wrap it with the bow of gratitude and appreciation, which is just holding that thought, that feeling, that emotion in higher regard. I want you to pay attention to the word appreciation because I think most people think of appreciation as just being grateful for something. But if you think about appreciation from the perspective of, let's say real estate and you have a home and you take note that that house has appreciated in value, that means that it went from being worth, let's say, 500,000 and maybe now it's worth a million. So it appreciated in value. So now that same house you hold in your possession in higher value. That my friends and gems is what it actually means to appreciate. And normally when a house has appreciated it, has appreciated, excuse me, you are noticing that it went up in value from the past to where you stand in the present. So it already happened. So now you are grateful that that house appreciated in value. So now you appreciate that home. And the same thing is true for you when you are co-creating a new reality for yourself, when you're trying to change the thoughts, feelings, and emotions that your brain has been signaling to your body and that's pulling up from the hard drive of your body those old emotional patterns, that the old cell memory that are, that's inside lodged in your body. Now that you create your new reality, 
and you're firing and wiring 2600 neural synapses the last part after you've broadcasted the emotion of love unconditional love and of joy you have gratitude and now appreciation your brain goes oh this is something that already happened because typically 99 percent of the time the only time you have gratitude and appreciation is when things have happened in the past so since your brain doesn't measure time it goes oh okay it's something that already it's it's a past memory so then it's going to lodge those emotions into your body so that's why every time you do it it becomes easier and easier and as you begin to do it with your health you do it with your wealth you do it with your spiritual aspect of your of your soul you do it with your emotions you do it with your your psychology you do it with your physical body in terms of fitness in terms of how your body actually feels you start to implement it in all the different areas of your life and then you start to implement it as well when you start to see an unwanted circumstance in your midst you lose something you get into an accident you whatever it is you get into an argument whatever unwanted situation that is presenting itself before you you are now able to hit the pause button slow down your heart heart rate slow down your breath slow down your brain waves open up your heart broadcast that unconditional love put in your mind's eye in the motion picture screen of your mind you're going to play what it is that you want and then feel that elevated emotion of joy, of love, and then you're excited because in your mind's eye, you're witnessing that which it is. You're actually creating a future memory, your future mind mapping, and then pulling it into the now. As you add the elevated emotions of joy, as you add the elevated emotions of love, and as you then wrap the whole thing up then with gratitude and appreciation, and then you're so excited because yes, 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 you did it. You got your order in. And then when you know you got it, you let it go because you can't be attached to when it's going to happen. It's part of the secret of this. It's part of the formula. You just got to let go, which is why Dr. Joe is so brilliant when you go to his seven day advance. He also talks about it here, but there's nothing like kinesthetically doing something and not just reading about it. And at the monastery, one of the things that he does, he actually has a trust and a release and a let go exercise challenge, big challenge that we have to do in order to effectuate this so that we physically get what it's like to feel to let go. So you can do, you can recreate that feeling of letting go. If you're not, if, if, cause I know that for some of us, it was that whole letting go is probably the most difficult part of doing this is letting go. And so to trust another to catch you so that you don't fall, so that you don't get hurt, so that you don't have pain is, is a tough lesson for, for some more than others. And so let me tell you my personal experience when I was at the monastery the first time with Dr. Joe, uh, there's a thousand of us in Cancun. And because I had many of the people that were, you know, of a thousand of us, I really don't know what the exact number is of people who were there with injuries or with diseases or with illnesses or conditions or syndromes. But there's probably a lot of people um, who had physical pain in their body. So, you know, I had suffered a traumatic brain injury. I actually had a neck injury. C5 and I had C6 in my lower, lower back. So I was, I actually had neck pain. I actually had back pain. I was actively doing Tai Chi uh, every day for the last several years prior to that and meditating as well. But now I'm meditating using his guided meditations since uh, let's say March. So four months prior to my going to the monastery. So the, the, the thing that he had us do, he had this, um giant i guess you'd call it like a net like a mesh net and so in the exercise he had a, the entire group i don't know there's probably about 30 of us i would say in the group and so they pick one person to go up on the platform and 
they, they're all holding this giant mesh. And the platform, that particular platform, which is different than walking the plank, when we, when we stood up on this platform, the platform was maybe 10 feet, maybe 10 or 12 feet at the most. It wasn't very high. So you get up on the platform and on the platform is one of the group leaders. And so they're there, they're gonna coach you, they're going to help guide you and give you instructions what to do. You know, they kind of talk you, if you're nervous, uh, they talk you down. But basically, you know, they tell you, you know, you're gonna, you know, hold your hands over your heart. Everybody is to hold their hands over their heart. And so then you have to step on to the edge you know, so that your toes are like right there at the edge of the plank. And so they, they instruct you to stand up to the edge. And the thing is, you're not doing it. You're not obviously going to fall forward. So you're actually going to turn your back to the group. And then you have to trust that your teammates are going to catch you in that net. Kind of like a trampoline. And so you have to fall backwards and then just trust. So for me, and I'm sure that I'm not the only one who had this thought going um, through my mind, but I was thinking, oh my gosh, it's like, not only do I have to trust that they're going to be able to catch me, and this time, as luck would have it, I was not the first person, because as you guys know, I'm on the smaller scale of people. So I'm, you know, I'm only five foot one and I'm only about a hundred pounds. So I don't weigh very much. So surely there were people that were far bigger, taller and heavier than I was. And they were, they caught them fine. So I didn't have issues so much with that. My concern was that because of, you know, the net, obviously the net is like a trampoline. So it's soft and pliable, but obviously when you, you just the position of, falling onto the net, I thought, oh my gosh, it's, it's, it's possible and probable, the likelihood is very high that I'm going to suffer a good amount of pain as I hit the net because my neck and my back. And then I was thinking, and I was thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to withstand that pain. And maybe I won't be able to get out of, you know, that, that could be really, really terribly painful it's like re-injuring yourself so that was the thought that was going through my head and i caught myself because my focus was what i noticed was that my focus was where i did not want it to be and so i realized it's like okay so there are two issues at hand what my mind my old personality was worrying about trusting that i would be caught and then secondly, about the pain that I was going to feel the moment I hit the net. That's not what I wanted. That's what I thought I knew would happen. Remember in the last chapter how Dr. Joe talks specifically about how our brain likes to go to that which is familiar. So what was familiar to me was something as simple as putting my head on a pillow on the bed would cause pain. And that's something that I'm controlling. And so I'm gingerly trying to put my head, you know, on a pillow so that I experience the least amount of pain. Usually it would be first my, my neck and then my back. And so for me to think that I'm all of a sudden just going to whoop, fall on that net and not experience pain was up until that moment unfathomable. It was unthinkable because I didn't have any history, any memory wired in my brain to make it so. So in that moment, I had to think, oh, wait a minute, I'm trying to go to the familiar past. That's what's happened in the past. No, I had to think, I'm one with the one. My first thought was actually, I'm one with the one. I am the one. I got this. I'm going to be fine. They're going to catch me. I'm lighter than most. Um, and, and my neck and my, 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 back, my body's going to be fine. My body's going to be fine. My body's going to be fine. I got this. I got this. My body's going to be fine. I'm one with the one. I am the one. My body's going to be fine. I got this. And so I had to change the old record for the new record. 
the new recording that I was actually installing in that moment. And so, and for a split second, again, your brain goes back to the familiar past. It went back to the eye beam because we had already done that challenge. And I thought, holy cow, I would much rather go do the eye beam because think about it. In the eye beam, even though I was 50 feet up in the air, I didn't have to rely on my teammates for that. It didn't require trust on that regard. I was more in control. I was just managing my mind. And now I was just at my own pace. I was taking each step steady eddy. So I was more in control in that environment, even though more dangerous, but more dangerous unless I fell. If I fell, then that could be obviously more painful. However, in this exercise, out the gate, I had to trust all of these other people who were my teammates. Albeit mo most, I didn't know, most of them were strangers, but they were my soul sisters and my soul brothers, really, because we are all of like mind. And I knew that one of the things that, they, that the people are doing that were holding the net, which is a big help, I think it's an energy that really helps you switch and recognize from that familiar place to the new neural pathways that you're installing. What they're doing, because we're instructed when we're holding the net, we're instructed to just hold a space of love and we're broadcasting love because we're like, we love you, we love you. So you have 30 people that are projecting to you, we love you, we love you, you got this, we love you, we love you so much, we, we have unconditional love for you. Imagine that. You have 30 people that are there. They know you can do it. You're not going to back out. You're going to go through it. You're going to be fine. You're going to be safe. It's going to feel fine. And, and you're fine. So you have 30 cheerleaders. You have 30 angels that are right there for you. I, I so hope you guys all at some point get to experience that. And so lo and behold, I got, I, I became aware, I became conscious. I switched from the familiar to the unfamiliar. I embraced what it is that I wanted. When I was ready, I turned around and then of course the guide asked me, are you ready? And I said, yes, I'm ready. So I turned around, stood at the edge and then I let myself fall. And I got to tell you, that was a lot more scary than it was walking the plank. And then I fell and then it was a very graceful fall. I landed on the, on the net and Lo and behold, no pain. My head didn't hurt, my neck. I wasn't so much worried about my head. I was really worried about a piercing pain going through my neck and through my back. Because it's, if any of you have had a back or a neck injury, ooh, just talking about it right now, it's like making me go, kind of getting like a little emotional. Because it really hurts. So, sorry. So, that's what I was afraid of. And so I realized I didn't need to be afraid of that anymore. Give me a second here. And you don't need to be afraid of that anymore. You can take that familiar past, that pain, that suffering, that sadness, that shock, that grief, Whatever that negative emotion is, it, you can file it away and make it part of your permanent past that doesn't own a space in your now so that you can move forward in joy. And now you know that, yes, you may have had pain in the past, but that actually was a place of love for you, believe it or not. It was a loving thing that happened for you, not against you. That pain point is there to teach you something, to teach you also something about yourself. It has taught me that lesson and others that have caused me pain, emotional, relational, psychological pain, financial pain, have taught me self-mastery have taught me to become a, a bigger asset with me, to connect with that true, the real self, the real me, that, that part of me that has unconditional love, that part of me that is one with the one, that is the one, that is collected to the, 
it's connected to the divine, to the infinite source intelligence. That's where all those things have led me to. And perhaps some of the physical and emotional pain that I had in the past, maybe it wasn't enough for me to really, it, it already had me on this path, but apparently the heat had to be turned up where I really suffered a physical and emotional pain because that was a very physically painful experience. And it also was a emotionally painful, psychologically painful and relationally painful experience. Because when I had that happen to me, even, you know, well, I'm not going to get into my past relationship, but let's just say, to say the least, it was minimized and discounted. And it was as if, you know, again, my little pet dog, Gigi, would have had more consideration, more care um, than I had. And that was very hurtful too, but it also showed me that I was on the right path of what what I needed to do to separate myself from that relationship to no longer uh, be in that space. So again, there, it was loaded with lessons. I continue. There's a whole bunch of jewels that I have taken from that entire experience. There are things that continue to reveal themselves for me. And the same thing is true for you. I'm not going to say it's going to be true because if you are watching this at this time, you already have the awareness that there is a whole Google library of experiences and of jewels and of lessons that you can claim that are yours. Yeah, that's the great news. <laughs> so funny, the indigo light happens to be on on the light and that has to do with higher wisdom. That's connected to your eighth energy center, which is eight, eight, uh, 18 inches above your head, that energy center. And it turned pink, which is love and red. So I think that, no coincidence there. I think the universe is trying to signal to us that this is a powerful conscious moment that you are connected, you're tuned in, tapped in, turned on exactly where you, where you need to be. So let's move on to the next section. I hope this is of help to you guys. Please use this online forum of YouTube, the comments below. It's an open-ended class. We can continue in the conversation. You can do this. You definitely can do this. If you feel that you need a little more assistance, maybe just one session or a series of sessions, you need guidance, connect with me. I do one-on-ones, sometimes we do small groups, but get the help that you need so that you can move on and you can tap into this infinite source of intelligence, which you are connected to. You don't need to be oblivious of it anymore. And you can create a better life for you, for your family, and you're upping your vibe. Your vibrational frequency is ascending. You're helping everything around you because your electromagnetic frequency is being expanded out. Okay, on to the next section. Often, we only appear to be awake. It's funny because it kind of relates to what we were just talking about. So since the body becomes the subconscious mind, it's easy to see that in situations when the body becomes a mind, the conscious mind no longer has much to do with our behavior. The instant we have a thought, feeling or reaction, the body runs on automatic pilot. We go unconscious. So take, for example, a mother driving a minivan to drop her kids off at school. How is she able to navigate traffic, break up arguments, drink her coffee, shift gears, and help her son blow his nose all at once? <laughs> Much like a computer program, these actions have become automatic functions that can run very fluidly and easily. Mom's body is skillfully doing everything because it has memorized how to do all these deeds through much repetition. She no longer, she no longer has any conscious thought about how she does them. They're habitual. Think about that. 5% of the mind is conscious, struggling against 95% that is running subconscious automatic programs. We've memorized a set of behaviors so well that we have become automatic, habitual body-mind. In fact, when the body has memorized a thought, action, or feeling to the extent that the body is the mind, when the mind and body are one, we are in a state of being the memory of ourselves. 
That's what I just talked about right before we got into this section, that you're going back to a past memory of who you were, past memories, thoughts, feelings, and emotions that are actually lodged into your brain. That's actually what happened to me the moment I got choked up because I was recalling the past feeling and pain um, in my body. So being the memory of ourselves, and if 95% of who we are by age 35 is a set of involuntary programs, memorized behaviors and habitual emotional reactions, it flows and follows that 95% of our day, we are actually unconscious. We only appear to be awake, yikes. So a person may consciously want to be happy, healthy or free, but the experience of hosting 20 years of suffering and the repeated cycling of those chemicals of pain and pity have subconsciously conditioned the body to be in a habitual state. We live by the habit when we're no longer aware of what we're thinking, doing, or feeling. We become unconscious. The greatest habit we must break is the habit of being ourselves. So when the body is running the show, here are some practical illustrations of the body being in a habitual state. Have you ever been unable to consciously remember a phone number? Try as you may, you can't even recall three digits out of the string of numbers required to make the call. And yet you can pick up the phone and watch as your fingers dial the number. Your conscious thinking brain can't remember the number, but you've practiced this action so many times with your fingers that your body now knows and remembers better than your brain. So that example was for those of us who grew up before speed dialing or cell phones came along. Perhaps you've had the same experience with typing your PIN into an ATM or entering a password online. Similarly, I can recall times when I worked out at a gym and had a locker with a combination lock. I was so tired after the workout that I couldn't remember the combination and I'd stare at the dial trying to recall the sequence of three numbers and they wouldn't surface. However, when I started to twirl the dial, the combination would come back to me almost as if by magic. Again, this happens because we practice something so many times that our bodies know better than our minds. The body consciously or subconsciously rather has become the mind. And remember that 95% of who we are by the age 35 sits in the same subconscious memory system in which the body automatically runs a program set of behaviors and emotional reactions. So in other words, the body is running the show. So when the servant becomes the master, in truth, the body is the servant of the mind. It follows that if the body has become the mind, the servant has become the master and the former master, the conscious mind, has gone to sleep. The mind might think it's still in charge, but the body is influencing decisions equal to its memorized emotions. So now let's say the mind wants to get back in control. What do you think the body is going to say? Where have you been? Go back to sleep. I've got it together here. You don't have the will, the persistence or the awareness to do what I've been doing all the time while you were unconsciously following my orders. I even modified my receptor sites over the years in order to serve you better. You thought you were running things while I have been influencing you all along, urging you to make all of your decisions equal to the, what feels right and familiar pause button, big time pause button here, because I want you to think about what was just said here, what we just read. Make all of your decisions equal to what feels right and familiar. If what feels right and familiar to you because your past, let's say you grew up in a, an abusive household. Let's say your mother abused you. Maybe she hit you. Maybe she was verbally abusive to you. If she was verbally abusive to you. 
and physically abusive to you. She was also emotionally and spiritually and psychologically abusive to you. She didn't know any better. If she did, she would have done better. But now what's familiar and what feels right to you is abuse, is conflict, is pain, sorrow, feeling sad, depressed, probably getting into pity parties. Even though you know that joy and happiness feels better, if that's your familiar past and you're asleep, you're unaware that that feels right to you, then you're going to keep doing it over and over again. And you're going to have relationships where you recreate that. It's a, there's a high likelihood that you are going to be the perpetrator where you are going to inflict that level of pain on another and be the abuser that you disliked, but it was familiar and it felt right to you. That's what you're going to inflict on another. So you're going to find yourself instigating arguments, maybe things that don't make any sense, but you are going to grasp at straws. If you can't find anything, you will find the most inane things just to stir up the feeling of being angry and abusing. You may not be consciously trying to abuse the other person, but you're trying to get what feels right to you and what feels familiar. So you're going to try to stir up an argument where oftentimes there really is no argument even there. Now, this may resonate with some of you. That happened to be my experience in my last relationship where luckily I didn't come from an abusive background, but my ex did. And so he was used to constant conflict. And to be honest with you, in my history, I never argued with my first husband. We didn't get into fights. We didn't have arguments. There, we were on the same page of music for most things. So you're probably wondering, well, why did that fall apart? You know, why, why did you guys uh, go split still? Well, there wasn't really love in the relationship. And so, you know, there's nothing to argue about other than the fact that there's, you know, which I wouldn't argue about that either because I would never want to require of somebody to genuinely care for me or to, you know, want to be affectionate with me if, it, if that wasn't genuine. So then that's not my thing. So if somebody is emotionally unavailable, they're emotionally unavailable. You don't, don't, you don't try to make somebody who's emotionally unavailable round peg, have them fit into a square hole. No, it's time to recognize round peg, square hole. You know what? It worked for a long time, but it doesn't work anymore. So time to move on. And I don't know, maybe, maybe some of this or none of this resonates with you. What matters is that maybe some element of this somewhere in your life resonates with you. And it would be my hope and my dream that if you can heal at least one aspect of yourself, if you can just begin to start to do the work of, of introspection, which sounds like a heavy weight to pick up, but just look at your past, look at whatever patterns that you've had, look at Look at the unwanted. The unwanted is a great way to define the wanted. If you have arguments, then you want peace, right? Or maybe you don't. Maybe you are so addicted to the pattern of arguments. You're so addicted to fighting. You're so addicted to blowing up. I don't know about you guys, but for me, that didn't feel good. I don't like getting into the habit of getting angry. We have more control over our emotions than we give ourselves credit to. I will, I will, I want to share something with you because when I was growing up, I, I, I grew up where I was kind of a shy kid, very introverted, um, kind of a passive kid. And in contrast, the divine knew that I needed somebody to maybe waken and shaken me up a little bit. So I had my brother who was just two years younger than me was very mercurial, very dramatic, wears his heart on his sleeve, very outgoing, very hot tempered, very articulate. Um, everything is just very, very with him. And he was very provocative. He loved, like if everything was calm, he liked to stir things up. He was very provocative. And um, so he used to, he knew that I had a very long fuse. 
So he used to like to jab at me because he wanted to rile things up. And, you know, if I wasn't engaging with him, at least he could engage with me if he instigated a fight or an argument. I never, we never fought physically. I just, I was never into that. So, so although I'm sure if I would have engaged him physically, you know, he was a young boy, so I'm sure he would have gone for it, but it was never my thing. I was two years older than him, a little bigger than him, but not a lot. But long story short, um, so he would instigate, he would be, he was the provocateur. And so, but to be honest with you, you know, he, he wouldn't even ruffle my feathers. It took a lot to ruffle my feathers. I was naturally patient, naturally unfazed, naturally in recognition that he was two years younger. I naturally was aware that he was younger, knowing less than me. He was my little brother. And so, you know, I let a lot of things go. It wasn't worth, it didn't even occur to me, to be honest with you, it didn't even occur to me to argue with him. It didn't occur to me to fight with him. It took me 15 years. Some of you would say, man, you were slow. Okay, yeah, maybe I was slow. Uh, maybe I was a slow learner. I don't know. I did well in school, but in that, and that, I guess maybe that's a testament to how strong we are wired in terms of whatever our innate hardwiring system is. I was just easygoing. So I was 15 years old and I remember thinking, something's got to change because this is ridiculous. And I noticed that my parents acquiesced to him, catered to him, and they would tell him, tell me, you know, oh, don't, um, don't let him get madder and madder, you know, just give in to him. So that he uh, so that he won't get mad because getting mad is not good for you, and you're the older, the wiser, the more mature one. You have better judgment, so you can teach him by your actions that it is wiser, more prudent, more mature to be your way. But I noticed that if I gave in to him, 15, you know, a hundred percent of the time, he expected me to always give in to him. He expected me never to react. He expected me never to get mad because I never did get mad, um, to not get bothered. I just, I was kind of like a slippery bar of soap, which kind of frustrated him and it made him matter to the point where he would really do something that then would provoke me. And so I decided, you know what, just to get him off my back, I go, nothing's gonna change if I don't change. Uh, my parents are gonna still encourage me to keep, keep going on with the flow. And my brother's not gonna change, he is who he is. So I decided I needed to be the one to change. So I decided I'm gonna to have to act. Even though I'm not angry, I'm going to have to become a little actress, but I'm gonna to have to make believe that I'm angry just to get him off my back at the beginning so I don't have to endure all of his banter. And so I instinctively knew that that would work. So next time he came around, he started to jab me, provoke me and try to, you know, give me a rise. And I immediately, I acted, I behaved. I just pretended that I was mad, I'm like, stop it. Blah, and I yelled back at him. And then of course, the moment I did that, then he fell back on his, on his butt, laughing and laughing and laughing because he accomplished his goal. He made me angry. And I was like, stop doing that. I'm going to tell mom, da, 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 da. But the reward for me was that I didn't have to deal with this for an hour or two hours or for however long he was going to be at me and at me and at me and at me until I finally was able to get away. Instead, by immediately responding with being mad and talking back to him, he fell back in satisfaction. He got his narcissistic supply because he was an energy vampire, but he didn't know it. But he got the satisfaction that he made me angry because it was such a challenge for him because I never got angry. So I said, it worked. So then I was like, <laughs> so then, you know, I told him off and then I left. I acted like I was storming out. I locked both doors. My room had a, a, a door to the left and a door to the right, one to the family room and one that led to the hallway to the other bedrooms. So I locked both of them. <laughs> I remember getting in my, like laying down on my bed and I was just laughing. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. It worked. That was so easy. 
okay, I'm not telling you here to react in anger with whoever it is who's being a pain in your life. I'm just telling you that we have more control over our reactions. But I want to share with you what I discovered as I continued to do that. Because as I continued to behave in that way, so I would get him off my back, I actually learned to become angry. And before I knew it, I legitimately was feeling the feelings of anger. It wasn't just the words of anger that I was faking it because I wasn't, when I first did it, I didn't feel the emotion of anger in my body. I was just acting it from the mouth out. But as I continued to do that, it caught me by surprise when one day I realized I was legitimately angry at him. And I was like, whoa. And then that recognition of being angry at him made me angrier at him because I recognized that I had been that I, I, I felt in that moment, like he forced me to learn to be angry. And I didn't like that. And he didn't force me to anything, but that's how I languaged it in my head. It's like, you made me, no, nobody made me. But in my head, I thought, you made me become angry. I don't wanna be, I don't wanna be like him. I don't wanna be angry like him. But in my head, I thought, you made me be, angry. I had to become angry to deal with you. So you made me angry. And that was the wrong script. And then it took me a lot while longer before I realized, no, he didn't, he didn't make me angry. I chose to defend myself by acting out in anger to stop the, the grief, to stop the suffering, to stop that kind of energy abuse and to free myself from him. And I thought, this is really uncanny. As I reflect back now as an adult, it really goes back to this work of self-mastery. You can if you think you can. If you think you can do this, you can. If you think you can't do this, you're right. Because whatever, I think it was Ralph Waldo Emerson who said that whatever the, the mind of man can conceive, it can achieve. And... Ralph Waldo Emerson also said, to thyself, to thyself also be true. So in other words, know who you truly are. You are not those negative thoughts, feelings, actions, and emotions. That is not you. When you were a baby, you didn't have any of that baggage, any of that garbage. That's not the true you. The you that's wallowing, oh, yes, I'm using alcohol to numb myself because um, I have these feelings that, I don't have the courage to deal with because that's what most alcoholism is. Most drug use, most alcohol is a desire to self soothe with something outside of you. So you drink, you take weed, pot, marijuana, whatever other names there are for that, whatever could be prescription drugs, anxiety, anti-anxiety medication. It could be, it could be a myriad of things. It could be all sorts of illegal drugs that are on the, on the street, but make no mistakes. That desire to be in that state of feeling that that, that drug induces alcohol or any legal or illegal drug, being in that feeling state, you don't feel the emotions. You actually disconnect. You're disconnecting from the world as you know it. You're disconnecting your heart your heart is not coherent at all. You're disconnecting your heart from your brain and your brain disconnects, your heart disconnects and your soul disconnects, whether you wanna recognize it or not. That's why they call alcohol spirits because there are other, it opens up if you drink too much. I'm not saying don't drink at all. I, you know, I don't know about you, but I like a nice red wine. Jesus made a great, fine Merlot and I hear his cab was pretty awesome too. I'm sure you've read about it, about the wedding where he multiplied the, the wine. So there's nothing wrong with having a drink socially, enjoying a glass of wine. 
I have no objections for that. It's when you abuse that thing. It could be, you may be disconnecting in the same way, numbing yourself, denying yourself to feel certain emotions. You don't want to unravel that. You think it's a Pandora's box. And maybe it's gambling. Maybe it's shopping. Maybe it's uh, working. Maybe it's the boob tube where you're addicted to watching sports 24 seven video games. I mean, there is no limit. You could be addicted to just about anything. You have to pay attention if you're escaping from yourself and not wanting to look in the mirror and see what is it that I need to unravel? Because you know what? You have a tremendous amount of energy and power that if you are going to stand in your truth and have the courage to look in the mirror, quiet yourself down, unpack those emotions and say, okay, yeah, this really doesn't feel good, but let me let it digest in my body. Let me cry the tears of pain, man or woman. We all, when we cry, this was a hard lesson for me too, because I had to become an expert as I think I mentioned in breaking, not breaking the habit of being yourself. I think I mentioned it in becoming supernatural towards the end. As, as a kid, I was so super sensitive. I was emotionally super sensitive and I was also very spiritually sensitive, very empathic. Um, so I would feel everything a little too much. So I had to learn how to pack those feelings, depress them, suppress them, repress them to the point where if it was a positive feeling, I was cool with it. But if it was a feeling of crying or sadness or grief, I would pack it down. I would not allow myself to feel that emotion. And I sure as heck was not about to shed a tear. No, I became the queen of, you know, suppression of, of negative emotions to the point where in my late thirties, yeah, my late thirties, I think it was a little before that, but in my late thirties, I realized I need to, I need to unwind this. This is not good. This is not healthy. This is actually really not good for me. And I realized that I had a lot of, a lot of stuff that I needed to resolve, a lot of emotions that I needed to digest. And when you allow yourself to cry, you don't have to be in front of, of, of anybody else. The first few times I tried to give myself, I was a, alone in my bedroom and I was trying to give myself permission to cry. I'm like, there's nobody in there. It was a long time before I was able to cry. It really was. And then once I started to allow myself to cry, I learned that I was digesting those emotions, not just in my heart, not just in my soul, but my body also. It was really, there's something very cleansing, cathartic. When you cry, you let go. And then you can, then other thoughts come up, other sad feelings. Sometimes you have memories of things that happened in your childhood that made you sad that you don't, you didn't remember. And now you're like, oh my gosh, I'd forgotten about that. Holy cow. Oh my gosh. Yes. I remember this. Oh my gosh. I remember that nightmare when I was a kid. Oh, I remember that thing that my mom did. Oh, I remember that thing that my brother did. Oh, I remember that thing that girl told me in third grade, whatever. So you release it and you let it go. Nobody needs, and you know what? That's something that you do as a gift to yourself. That's what this work, this is all, it all, it all comes together. Okay, so I'm gonna read that last sentence ago, again, because I think it's important. And if you have a book, highlight it in your Kindle, your iPad, your paper bound book, highlight it. It is on page 64. You thought you were running things while I have been influencing you all along and urging you to make all of your decisions equal to what feels right and familiar. And when the 5% that is conscious is going against 95% that is running subconscious automatic programs, and 95% is so reflexive that it only takes one stray thought or a single stimulus from the environment to turn on the automatic program again. So then we're back to the same old, same old thinking, the same thoughts, performing the same actions. 
but expecting something different to happen in our lives. Pause button. Of course, nothing different is going to happen because you're running the same thoughts, feelings, actions, and emotions. Your brain is the master. You're letting it run, run the show and your mind is asleep. And so it's just, it's doing a replay. Rewind, replay, rewind. You're on a feedback loop that doesn't serve you. So of course, you're not going to get what you want. The answer would be no. So if that's not a feeling thought, what you need to do is say, oh, that's how I used to think. No, brain, no, ego. I know you're trying to protect me, keep me on the same path that I've been on, but no, that doesn't serve me anymore. I don't want to think those worst case scenarios anymore. That's fear. I choose love. I'm going to choose feeling loving thoughts. The universe always has my back. I love and appreciate myself. Everybody loves me. I am one with the one. I am the one. I am connected to infinite source intelligence. I am one with God. My angels are always around me, always guiding and protecting me. I'm always picking up on the cues, the signals, the signs, the serendipity, all the clues that, that the universe that God is putting it before me for my highest good and for the highest good of all are always surrounding me with every beat of my heart, with every breath that I take as I go deeper and deeper in my knowingness of who I am, where I'm going, who I am becoming. This is my new truth. Use your own language. You don't have to say word for word what I just said. It's the feeling of love. So, because when we try to break the internal chemical order we have made so second nature, the body goes into chaos. Its internal badgering feels nearly irresistible and plenty of times we succumb. Enter into the subconscious to change it. The subconscious mind only knows what you have programmed it to do. Have you ever been typing along on your laptop and all of a sudden your computer starts running automatic programs that you have no control over? When you try to use the conscious mind to stop the automatic subconscious programs stored in your body, it's like yelling at a computer that's gone rogue with several programs running while windows are popping up and showing more, more than you can handle. Hey, stop that. The computer isn't even going to register that. So all you're talking, hey, stop that, makes no difference. It's going to keep doing what it does until there is some sort of intervention, until you get into its operating system and change some settings. In this book, you will learn how to get into the subconscious and reprogram it with a new set of strategies. In effect, you have to un learn or unwire your old thinking and feeling patterns and then relearn and rewire your brain with new patterns of thinking and feeling based on who you want it to be instead. And put a put a pause button right here. If you have Gaia, I would highly recommend that you check out Dr. Joe's series called Rewired. And in that series, he goes into how to rewire your brain. Okay, moving on. When you condition the body with a new mind, the two can no longer work in opposition, but must be in harmony. This is the point of change of self-creation. Pause button. 
So the greatest, one of the greatest takeaways that I had from the first time that I went to the monastery with Dr. Joe was in the face of anything unwanted of an un, either it was something in my external that I saw that I did not want, or if I caught myself thinking a negative thought towards my husband or my ex-boyfriend, I go stop. I'm gonna, that's how I used to think, change. I'm not gonna do that any longer. In uh, one of his uh, meditations, he talks about, I think it's the, the box meditation where he talks about, you can take those unconscious thoughts that pop into your brain, unconscious actions. You find yourself, you quit sugar and you find yourself reaching over for sugar instead of going for the maple, maple, you know, maple syrup that's grade B that's organic, that has a lower hypoglycemic index as an example. So you're gonna go, oh, change. Nope, that's how I used to be. This is how I am now. You think a negative thought of someone, your boss, your neighbor, your friend, your sister, your brother, whoever, whoever it is that you have a beef with. And you go, change. You might go to think it and go, change. Nope, that's how I used to be. I don't do that anymore. And for me, the next step is always, I'm going to slow down my heart rate because I hit the pause button. I'm going to slow down my heart rate. I'm going to slow down my breath and I'm going to slow down my brain waves. And I'm going to go into theta. Even if I only go into theta for three minutes, doesn't matter. Two minutes, doesn't matter. The amount of time that I go into theta doesn't matter. But the whole point is to rewire my brain, recondition it to my new mind so that I am the new me. I no longer have the old personality. I'm creating my own personal reality by rewiring my brain and creating a no, a new personality, the new me. And you can do this too. If I could do it, you most definitely can do it. Just your choice, your wanting to do it, your desire to do it, your wishing to do it, it's all you need. Then you just decide, okay, that's it. She says I can do it, I can do it. That doesn't mean that every time you go to do it, it's gonna be 100%. It's no different than if you were to take up golf. It's not like you're gonna pick up golf and you're gonna be a scratch golfer day one. No, it's a skill that you're going to acquire. And you weren't a golfer before, and then as you keep practicing golf, you become a golfer. And then you see that your score starts to drop. The first goal is to break 100, then to break 90. Maybe you're only golfing nine holes out of 18. So you wanna break 100 on nine holes. Then eventually you break 100 on 18 holes. And so the thing is progress. And one of my mentors, Joel Bauer, he defines happiness as when, when you are experiencing step by step, day by day, a little bit of progress, that's happiness. Because then you can look back a week later, you look a month ago, six months ago, a year ago, and you're like, wow, it didn't seem like there's that much progress. But now I look back six months that I've been on this new train and I left back the train of pain and I'm on, I'm on this new path now. I like the new me better. And it's like, I notice that I catch more of those thoughts and I'm able to hit the, I, I'm able to go up, oh, nope, change. That's the old me, my old personality, brain, do as I say. I'm gonna hit the pause button to slow down my heart rate, right? I'm gonna slow down my brain waves, slow down my brain waves. I'm gonna go into theta, I'm gonna do a little mini meditation just for a few minutes. I'm gonna go into the void. I'm gonna put in what I want. I'm gonna come back out just like that. It becomes easier and easier. And then that becomes the, the new you and that becomes your new habit. Okay. Next section, guilty until proven innocent. Kind of gave me the flashback of, of uh, divorce because it's like, you know, you're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. And you find out that that's not true in our legal system. It's really guilty until proven innocent. But let's find out what Dr. Joe has to say about guilty until proven innocent. 
So let's use a real life situation to illustrate what happens when we decide to break from some memorized emotional state and change our minds. So I think we can all relate to one common state of being, guilt. So I'm going to use that to illustrate in practical terms how this cycle of thinking and feeling works against us. Then we'll identify some of the efforts the brain body system is going to make to remain in control and preserve that negative state of being. Imagine that you frequently feel guilty about one thing or another. If something goes wrong in a relationship, a simple miscommunication, someone unreasonably misplacing his or her anger on you, pay close attention, a simple miscommunication, someone unreasonably misplacing his or her anger on you, misplacing, they shouldn't be doing that, but that's what they're doing, or whatever, you wind up taking the blame and feeling bad. Picture yourself as one of those people who repeatedly says or think, it was my fault, it was my fault. You're always taking responsibility for the poor actions and behaviors of others. And you're always feeling guilty. I'm gonna hit the pause button home because this, for me, has been a big deal. Hello, <sighs> I'm, I have Italian and Jewish background and Spanish background. I kid you not, you look up in the dictionary the word guilt, you have the Italians, you have the Jews, you have my grandmother, you've got my parents, my father especially. Man, we own guilt, we claim guilt, we, we have guilt competitions. I mean, if you're Italian or Jewish or both, you know what I mean. We can, we use guilt, oh my gosh, it is, you know, you've heard of the sort of truth, Oh, we love to use the sort of guilt. And it is nasty. It is, it is a thunderous energy sucking energy. That is a, I would, I will go out on a limb to say that it's a useless emotion. I mean, there are times where if you legitimately do something wrong, if you lash out at somebody, you know, some people have the habit of lashing out at others. The other person maybe didn't even deserve it, but it's your that's how you react. Maybe you unreasonably lashed out at somebody, or maybe you, um, you just did something that wasn't cool, something that wasn't right. And you recognize I shouldn't have done that. Or maybe you were um, quick to judge, or maybe you were quick to give your opinion and it offended somebody. You didn't intend to offend somebody, but if it offended somebody, so I could, that's a legitimate reason for feeling a little guilty, but don't dwell on the guilt. As you can tell, I've done a lot of work on myself on this and I had started working on this in my 20s because I recognized those patterns. And I thought, you know what? This is something about my family history. This is a generational curse thing that we have that goes back thousands of years. I am cutting this off. I do not want to bring that in when I have children. I didn't want to be guilting my kids and using that sort of guilt. And it's with words that we can oftentimes instill guilt in others. And I said, no, this is, this, is, this is not cool. This is not healthy. This is not, no, I'm going to take the great things. I had so many awesome, wonderful things of how I was raised between my mother and my father. I mean, my dad always said, take the, the great things that your parents taught you, learn some new things, and then integrate the two. And now for these times, teach your kids based on your new parenting style. Just keep, have that integration of the old and the new because we all have to do it. And so I knew that I had to do that. And so I took ownership of that because I recognized those patterns um, when I was in, I was in college when I started recognizing those patterns due to thanks um, there is a uh, professor, Mr. Professor Angeloni, who I took a social, it was a cultural anthropology class that really opened my eyes to different things that I recognized were not necessarily part of my religion, but it was a cultural thing that is very um, strong in, you know, in different cultures. So 
I can get into a whole litany about that, but we will we will let that go. We want to move on to the book here. So picture yourself as one of those people who repeatedly say or think it was my fault. That's also some 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 of us take over responsibility for the actions uh, actions and feelings of others. You don't need to do that. Each person is responsible for their own actions and feelings. They're a grown up. Um, if you if you don't want to say something because you don't want them to feel bad. You know, sometimes you have to tell somebody the truth and it might sting, but if it's the truth and it will help them grow, then you need to say whatever it is. And you're not responsible for how they feel or how they act. They're responsible for how they feel and how they act. They're a big boy. They're a big girl. And so you have to, there's a way of saying things with compassion and kindness that can still edify someone. It can be uncomfortable perhaps, but it doesn't have to have a sting. You don't have to have a forked tongue where you lash out at them because that's not beneficial for either of you. That's not the type of energy you want to be putting out in the world. You want to come from a place of love. Okay. So after 20 years of doing this to yourself, you feel guilty and think guilty thoughts automatically. You have created an environment of guilt for yourself and other factors have contributed to this. But for now, let's just say that with this notion of how you're thinking and feeling, you have created your state of being and your environment. So every time you think a guilty thought, you've signaled your body to produce the specific chemicals that make up the feeling of guilt. You've done this so often that your cells are swimming in a sea of guilt chemicals. Make no mistakes. There's a chemistry to guilt, just like there's a chemistry to fear, a chemistry of nervousness, a chemistry of anxiety, a chemistry of any and every emotion. So you're addicted to that chemical response, just like you would be you know, addicted to a cigarette or a joint or alcohol, or you fill in the blank, pick your poison. So the receptor sites on your cells adapt so they can make, yeah, so they can better take in and process that particular chemical expression of that guilt. So the enormous amount of guilt bathing the cells begins to feel normal to them. And eventually what the body perceives as normal starts to be interpreted as pleasurable. It's like living for years near an airport. You get so used to the noise that you no longer hear it, consciously at least unless one jet flies lower than usual and the roar of the engines is so much louder that then it gets your attention. The same thing happens to your cells. As a result, they literally become desensitized to the chemical feeling of guilt. They will require a stronger, more powerful emotion from you, a higher threshold of stimuli to turn on the next time. So and when that stronger hit of guilt chemicals gets the body's attention, your cells perk up at that stimulation, much like that first cup of java feels to a coffee drinker. And when each cell divides at the end of its life and makes a daughter cell, the receptor sites on the outside of the new cell will require a higher threshold of guilt. It's like needing more drugs to turn them on. Now the body demands a stronger emotional rush of, rush of feeling bad in order to feel alive. Pause button. That's why emotional abusers and physical abusers, somebody who is physically abusive will start physically abusing you mildly. And then you hear how it, it escalates till one day they strike heaven forbid. I, I you know, I, I knock on wood, have never had that experience and never will have that experience, but they, you know, slap, you know, the other party, the man slaps the woman as an, or, you know, punches her or what have you, or hits her in the gut, or I don't know exactly how that all goes, but obviously he's physically punching the person and it goes from gradual to more escalated abusive parents who whip their children. They pull out a leather belt. And at first, maybe it's a small tap, then a harder. And then they're so caught up in their rage that they don't even 
recognize the strength with which they are striking and harming that child, causing physical, emotional, spiritual, energetic harm to another human being in a very horrible, horrible way. But they need, they are so addicted to that anger, that rush of adrenaline, that in order for them to feel more, they have to strike more at the expense of another human being. That's no, no different than you, you, you have political dictators that get off on the same type of anger and rage, inflicting pain on the people that they're supposed to be serving. You see it at all sorts of different levels. So you will become addicted to guilt by your own doing. When anything goes wrong or is awry, awry, I'm sorry. When anything goes, when any thing goes wrong or is awry in your life, you automatically assume that you're the guilty party. But that seems normal to you now. You don't even have to think about feeling guilty. You just are. You just are that way. Not only is your mind not conscious of how you express your guilty state by the way you, the things you say and do, but your body wants to feel its accustomed level of guilt because that's what you trained it to do. You have become unconsciously guilty most of the time and your body has become the mind of guilt. Only when, say, a friend points out that you needn't have apologized to the store clerk for giving you the wrong change, do you realize how pervasive this aspect of your personality has become? Hit the pause button. I recognized that early in my career. You know, I, I, I was in my 20s when I started as a lender, and I was a young lender, and I also looked very young. I looked like I was in junior high or high school, and here I was out doing lending. And I found, I, somebody pointed out to me that I would say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I was sorry all the time. And I was, I was already paying attention to language and words because I've, I've, I've always been a writer. You know, when I was eight, nine, 10 years old, I would write 20, 30 page letters. So, and uh, so I had, actually I was in a, working in an ambulance company when, when my fellow emergency med tech pointed it out to me, he, he goes, he goes, you know, you don't need to be sorry about that. He's like, oh, I'm sorry. It was such a habit of saying, I'm sorry. It's like some people have a habit, which I also had at the time, of saying, oh, my God. Oh, my God, I'm sorry. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You know, not good. There, there's no reason for you be, to be saying, oh, my God, all the time. I'm sorry. When you say I'm sorry, that means I have sorrow. Why do you want to, why do you want to affirm sorrow? If you don't le legitimately have sorrow for something, why would you say I'm sorry? Better thing to say would be, pardon me, you know, excuse me or pardon me. But sometimes I was just using I'm sorry so often when I really didn't need to be. And again, that's that guilt thing. So let's say that these, this triggers one of those moments of enlightenment and epiphany of, and you think, She's right. Why do I apologize all the time? Women, if you're a lady, you're watching this, women tend to apologize 10 times more than men do. We tend to be quick to say, I'm sorry. Many times, like I said before, when it's not even your fault, there's nothing for you to be sorry. You're saying, oh, I'm sorry. My recommendation to you is stop. Decide to not be sorry. Stand in your power. Stop giving your power away, being sorry to everybody, even when you really aren't legitimately sorry. Stop, just stop. It's not good for you. It's not good energy that you're putting out. You're not standing in integrity. You're not being whole. You're putting out the wrong energy vibe. So stop, just decide to stop and start to pay attention how often time, how often you say you're sorry when you legitimately had no need to say you were sorry. Are you using it like a colloquialism as a filler word? Are you trying to be overly nice? You don't have to be so overly nice. Be you, you are good enough, okay? That's a whole seminar right there, but we're not gonna get into that right now. So, the book. 
she's right. Why do I apologize all the time? Why do I take responsibility for everyone else's missteps? After you reflect, <clears throat> after you reflect on your history of constantly pleading guilty, you say to yourself, today, I'm going to stop blaming myself and making excuses for other people's bad behavior. I'm going to change. I'm going to change. You're not requiring anybody else out there to stop drinking and thinking, to stop abusing, to stop. You fill in whatever the blank is. I, me, I am going to change. I am going to be the best, truest, fullest expression of myself. I'm going to be my authentic self. I'm going to stand in my own power. So because of your decision, you're no longer going to think the same thoughts. No, sorry. That produced the same feelings and vice versa. And if you falter, you've made a deal with yourself that you're going to stop and remember your intention. Pause button. Go to the mirror. If you decide to do this, and when would now be a good time for you to choose to do this? Now would be a good time for you to choose to do this. You decide now, I'm going to change that. I'm going to take back my power. I'm going to stop being so sorry. I'm going to align with my true self. So look in the mirror, look in the mirror in your own eyes, and you are going to make a commitment to yourself. Every morning when you brush your teeth, you look at yourself, you're going to say, hello, beautiful. Yes, I've got this. I'm the new me now. I've decided to no longer be sorry, to be guilty and take responsibility for everybody else's actions and feelings, thoughts, and emotions. I'm going to stand in integrity of myself and be my true self. If you have to, take a lipstick and write it in the first person. By writing it in the first person, you're saying, I am worthy. I am enough. I am so happy and excited. I am no longer sorry for everybody. I am no longer taking responsibility for everybody else's thoughts, feelings, actions, and emotions. Write it as an affirmation, as an I am in the current now. And then when you look at it, smile as you look at your eyes in the mirror, telling yourself your new truth. And if you falter, you've made a deal with yourself that you're going to stop and remember your intention. Two hours go by and you feel really good about yourself. You think, wow, this is actually working. Unfortunately, your body cells aren't feeling so good. Over the years, you've trained them to demand more molecules of emotion, guilt in this case. Those are fireworks, if you can hear them. <laughs> so over the years, you've trained them to demand more molecules of emotion, guilt in this case, in order to fulfill their chemical needs. So you've trained you have trained your body to live as a memorized chemical continuity, but now you're interrupting that, denying it, its chemical needs and going contrary to its sub subconscious program. So the body becomes addicted to guilt or any emotion in the same way that it would get addicted to drugs. At first, you only need a little of the emotion or drug in order to feel it. Then your body becomes desensitized and your cells require more and more of it just to feel the same again. Try. Trying to change your emotional pattern is like going through drug withdrawal. Pause button. Okay, when my son was about five or six years old, I remember he was going to a Lutheran, uh, to a Lutheran school. And of course, you know, they teach him the Ten Commandments. And <clears throat> it's pretty funny because he had told me, he called my attention. Oh, mom, he said, oh, God, don't take God's name in vain. And I said, yeah, yeah. And I kind of like brushed him off. I didn't pay attention that the universe, you know, God was actually trying to convict me of like, you shouldn't be doing this. And then he told me two or three times, mom, there you go again. You took God's name in vain. You said, oh, God. And I said, oh, oh, Kyle, you know, shush, you know. However... <laughs> This is how the universe works. It's so funny. So, of course, I book an appointment with, you know, my clergy and I'm sitting at his desk and I'm about to complain 
I don't normally complain, but I, in this particular instance, I was definitely complaining about something very specific. And as I began to express myself to him, I said, oh my God. And I was about to say what I, what I said, and he stopped me dead in my tracks. He said, absolutely not. We do not, and it shocked me as soon as he said, absolutely not, caught my attention. And he said, we do not take God's name in vain. And I was stunned and I didn't know what he was talking about. That's how ignorant, how asleep, how unconscious I was. He said, we do not take God's name in vain. We use it for prayer, praise and instruction. And I had, I really had duplicitous thinking at that time. I remember thinking, what is he talking about? God's name in vain? Did I take God's name in vain? I didn't take God's name in vain. So I'm thinking these thoughts as I'm hearing him say, we only use it for prayer, praise, and instruction. And I was thinking, am I even going to remember this? What do you mean I took God's name in vain? When I said, oh God, was that taking God's name in vain? Maybe that's taking God's name in vain. This is the actual languaging that was going in my brain that fast. Did I actually take God's name in vain? Maybe I took God's name in vain. Maybe I'm in ignorance that I took God's name in vain. Oh my gosh, I think I took God's name in vain. Holy cow, he's saying that I took God's name in vain. And then I thought, I thought taking God's name in vain was saying, God damn it. That's taking God's name in vain. Or using it, oh, using it as a filler word. So that was a very sobering moment for me. Because obviously the universe had brought me to that appointment to realize the gravity of what it was that I was doing. Because I was in ignorance of taking the divine's name in vain. As I left that meeting, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm taking, if that's taking God's name in vain, I'm taking God's name in vain a lot. I'm taking God's name in vain every day. I'm taking God's name in vain every hour. I'm doing that a dozen times an hour because as part of my vocabulary, unbeknownst to me, because I was asleep, I was unconscious. And even though I was surrounded by a lot of girlfriends who knew better, none of them had the courage to say, hey, uh, why do you keep on taking God's name in vain? Nobody had the courage to tell me. Nobody, not one. They all thought it was odd that I would so frequently take God's name in vain, but I was, I was taking God's name in vain in three languages. Three languages. Make no mistakes. So, and, then, and I realized that. I'm like, because oh, I do this in three languages. I'm like, oh, sometimes four. Oh. Yeah, I'm like, holy cow. I realized the power, that was an, a huge energy leak. Yeah, make no mistakes, that's an energy leak. So I'm, everything was, oh my God, this, oh my God, that, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. It took months. It was not easy. It took me, I think, like four or five months to get rid of that languaging out of my mouth, out of my thought process so that I wouldn't utter those words. So I wouldn't think that all the time in three to four languages. And then I realized the gravity of the people who do this like me, that are in ignorance of it. And we think in those languages, you know, it's a cultural thing. It's a, it's something that's just part of your culture, just as it was part of my culture to say it in English. And I thought, so many of us have been asleep. My question to you is, are you asleep? Is this the wake up call that you've needed to close that energy leak so that you can now properly in integrity, use that energy the way you're supposed to be using it? Only you know. Once your cells are no longer getting the usual signals from the brain about feeling guilty, they begin to express concern before the body and the mind were working together to produce this state of being called guilt. Now you are no longer thinking and feeling 
feeling and thinking in the same way. Your intention is to produce more positive thoughts, but the body is still all revved up to produce feelings of guilt based on guilty thoughts. Think of this as a kind of highly specialized assembly line. Your brain has programmed your body to expect one part that will fit into this larger assembly. All of a sudden, you've sent it another part. Yeah, you've sent it another part that doesn't fit into the space where the old guilty part once fit perfectly. Alarm goes off and the whole operation comes to a standstill. Your cells are always spying on what is happening in the brain and the mind. Your body is the best mind reader ever. Your body is the best mind reader ever. So they all stop what they are doing. Look up towards the brain and think, what are you doing up there? You insisted on being guilty and we loyally followed your commands for years. We subconsciously memorized a program of guilt from your repetitive thoughts and feelings. We changed our receptor sites to reflect your mind, modified our chemistry so that you could automatically feel guilty. We have maintained your internal chemical order independent of any external circumstances in your life. We are so used to the same chemical order that your new state of being feels uncomfortable, unfamiliar. We want the familiar, the predictable, and what feels natural. All of a sudden, you're going to change? We can't have that. So the cells huddle up and say, let's send a protest message to the brain. But we have to be sneaky because we want her to think that she's actually responsible for these thoughts. We don't want her to know they came from us. So now the cells send a message marked urgent right up the spinal cord to the surface of the thinking brain. I call that the fast track because the message goes straight up the central nervous system in a matter of seconds. At the same time, this is happening. The chemistry of the body and the chemistry of guilt is now at a lower level because you're not thinking and feeling the same way. But this drop doesn't go unnoticed. A thermostat in the brain called the hypothalamus also sends out an alarm that says chemical values are going down. We're not going to make more or we've got to make more, excuse me. We've got to make more. So the hypothalamus signals the thinking brain to revert back to the old habitual ways. This is the slow track because it takes longer for the chemicals to circulate through the bloodstream. The body wants you to return to your memorized chemical self. So it influences you to think in familiar routine ways. These fast track and slow track cellular responses occur simultaneously. And the next thing you know, you start to hear the chatter of the thoughts like these in your head. You're too tired today. You can start tomorrow. Tomorrow's a better day. Really? You can do it later. And my favorite, you know, this doesn't feel right. If that doesn't work, a second sneak attack occurs. The body mind wants to be in control again, so it starts picking on you a bit. Oh, it's okay for you to feel a little bit bad right now. It's your father's fault. Don't you feel bad about what you did in your past? In fact, let's take a look at your past so we can remember why you are this way. Look at you, you're a mess, a loser. You're a pathetic, you're weak, your life is a failure. You're, you're, you'll never change, you're too much like your mother. Why don't you just quit? As you continue this awfulizing, the body is tempting the mind to return to the state it has unconsciously memorized. On a rational level, that's absurd. But obviously on some level, it feels good to feel bad. Pause button. It's like backwards wiring. It feels good to feel bad. You know, 
I actually know of one person who lives on the East Coast who they're into cutting and they're wired backwards because when they get under stress, they have this overwhelming need to cut themselves. When they cut themselves, that actually feels good to them. That pain feels good to them. So that just shows you how backwards the wiring has been, it's been hijacked in a bad way. I can't imagine how feeling pain from a cut would actually feel good. And some of us do that with our emotions. And you gotta realize that, you know, those feelings of anger, feelings of anxiety, feelings of nervousness, feelings of fear, feelings of guilt, of unworthiness, of being not enough, of you know, just all those negative bad feelings of emotions. That shouldn't feel good. That should feel bad. And you should go, wait a minute, I need a checkup from the neck up. I need to rewire this brain. I need to, you know, you can't do it all at once. So just pick one thing. Maybe it's taking, oh God, out of your vocabulary. Maybe it's the feeling of guilt, taking that out of your brain's vocabulary and your body's memory. Maybe it's, who knows what it is. That could be the source, the root cause of an illness that you have the diabetes that you have, the sweetness that life has to offer you hasn't been allowed in, which is what throws off the literal sugar levels of your body because you're embracing guilt, you're embracing sadness and depression. Maybe that's the root cause. Maybe it's the root cause of your having all these accidents. Maybe it's the root cause of your being in anger. I mean, whatever the case might be, only you can do that self-discovery. And that's what this work is about, is that self-mastery so that you can put your hands on the steering wheel and say, I got this, and I'm going to change this, and I'm going to embrace love instead. So the moment we listen to those sub-vocalizations, believe those thoughts, and respond by feeling the same familiar feelings, mental amnesia sets in, and we forget our original aim. The funny thing is that we actually begin to believe what the body is telling the brain. Remember, it's what the body is telling the brain, not what the brain is telling the body. The brain receives what the body is feeling and then it releases those chemical cocktails. So it's what the body is telling the brain to say to us. We immerse ourselves back into that automatic program and return to being our old self. I'm going to hit the pause button here because I recently interviewed Alexandra Cousins and she talks about how she had a recognition as she was doing these meditations. She's one of Dr. Joe's advanced students too. And she began to realize that the root cause of her mystery illnesses was a death wish that she had on herself. She would, her thought was, I would just rather die than face X, Y, Z. I will link that here in the, in this video so that you have, let's see, this is on page, we are on page, 69, page 69. I will, I will link that video to the end of this video so that you can watch it after we're done. But when she made the connection and she had the awareness that she had a death wish on herself, she healed. Her life is radically different. She moved countries. I mean, everything. You'll have to watch the video and that is available to you too. And that's the exciting news. So most of us can relate to this little scenario. It's no different from any habit we've been trying to break. Whether we're addicted to cigarettes, chocolate, alcohol, shopping, gambling, or biting our nails, the moment we seize the habitual action, chaos ranges between the body and the mind. The thoughts we embrace are in intimately identified with the feelings of what it would be like to experience the indulgence. When we give into the cravings, we will keep producing the same outcomes in our lives because the mind and body are in opposition. 
our thoughts and feelings are working against each other. And if the body has become the mind, we will always fall prey to how we feel. You see how our lives are being servants? We are, we are subject to and we are servants of our body in ignorance? No more though. As long as we use familiar feelings as a barometer, as feedback on our efforts to change, we'll always talk ourselves out of greatness. We will never be able to think greater than our internal environment. We will never be able to see a world of possible outcomes other than the negative ones from our past. So our thoughts and feelings have that much power over us. Help is only a thought away. The next step in breaking the habit of being ourselves is understanding how important it is to get to the mind and body working together and breaking the chemical continuity of our guilt, ashamed, angry, depressed state of being, resisting the body's demand to restore that old unhealthy order isn't easy, but help is just a thought away. You will learn in the following pages that for true change to occur, it is essential to unmemorize an emotion that has become part of your personality and then to recondition the body to a new mind. It's easy to feel hopeless when we realize that the chemistry of our emotions has habituated our bodies to a state of being that is too often a product of anger, jealousy, resentment, sadness, and so forth. After all, I've said that these programs, these propensities are buried in our subconscious. The good news is that we can become consciously aware of these tendencies. I'll deal more with this concept in the pages ahead. For now, I hope that you can accept that to change your personality, you need to change your state of being, which is intimately connected to your feelings that you've just memorized, just as negative emotions can become embedded in the operating system of your subconscious, so can positive ones. By itself, conscious positive thinking cannot overcome subconscious negative feelings. At one time or another, we've all consciously declared, I want to be happy. But until the body is instructed otherwise, it's going to continue expressing those programs of guilt or sadness or anxiety or fear. The conscious intellectual mind may reason that it wants joy, but the body has been programmed to feel otherwise for years. We stand on a soapbox proclaiming change to be in our best interest, but on a visceral level, right in our solar plexus, we can't seem to bring up the feeling of true happiness. That's because the mind and body aren't working together. The conscious mind wants one thing, but the body wants another. If you've been devoted to feeling negatively for years, those feelings have created an automatic state of being. We could say that you are subconsciously unhappy, right? Your body has been conditioned to be negative. It knows how to be unhappy better than your, your conscious mind knows otherwise. You don't even have to think about how to be negative. You just know that it's how you are. How can your conscious mind control this attitude in the subconscious body mind? Some maintain that positive thinking is the answer. I want to be clear that by itself, positive thinking never works. Many so-called positive thinkers have felt negative most of their lives, and now they're trying to think positively. They are in a polarized state in which they are trying to think one way in order to override how they feel inside of themselves. They consciously think one way, but they are being the opposite. When the mind and body are in opposition, change will never happen. Memorized feelings limit us to recreating the past. By definitions, emotions are the end products of past experiences in life. When you're in the midst of an experience, the brain receives vital information from the external environment through five different sensory pathways, sight, smell, sound, taste, and touch. As that cumulative 
sensory data reaches the brain and is processed, networks of neurons arrange themselves into specific patterns reflecting the external and event. The moment those nerve cells string into place and the brain releases chemicals, and those chemicals are called an emotion or a feeling. And in this book, I use the words feelings and emotions interchangeably because they are close enough for our understanding. When those emotions begin to chemically flood the body, you detect a change in your internal order. You're thinking and feeling differently than you were moments before. Naturally, when you notice this change in your internal state, you'll pay attention to whoever or whatever in your external environment caused that change. When you can identify whatever it was in your outer world that caused your internal change, that event in and of itself is called a memory. Neurologically and chemically, you encode that environmental information into your brain and body. Thus, you can remember experiences better because you recall how they felt at the time they, they happened. And then feelings and emotions are a chemical record of past experiences. Pay note, highlight this. Feelings and emotions are a chemical record of past experiences. So for example, your boss arrives for your performance review. You notice immediately that he looks red-faced, even irritated. As he starts speaking in a loud voice, you smell garlic on his breath. He accuses you of undermining him in front of other employees. And he says he has passed you over for a promotion. In this moment, you feel jittery, weak in the knees and queasy, and your heart is raising, racing. You feel fearful, betrayed and angry. All of the cumulative sensory information, everything you're smelling, seeing, feeling, and hearing is changing. It's changing your internal state. You associate that external experience with a change in how you're feeling internally. And it brands you emotionally. You go home and repeatedly review this experience in your mind. Every time you do, you remind yourself of the accusing, intimidating look on your employer's face, how he yelled at you, what he said, and even how he smelled. Then you once again feel fearful and angry and you produce the same chemistry in your brain and the body as if the performance review is still happening. Because your body believes it is experiencing the same event again and again, you are conditioning it to live in the past. Let's reason this a bit further. Think of your body as the unconscious mind or as an objective servant that takes orders from your consciousness. It is so objective that it doesn't know the difference between the emotions that are created from experiences in your external world and those you fabricate in your internal world by thought alone. So to the body, they are the same. Like to your body, they're the same, and to your brain, they're the same. So what if the cycle of thinking and feeling that you were betrayed continues for years on end? If you keep dwelling on that experience with your boss or reliving those familiar feelings day in and day out, you continually signal, you continually signal your body with chemical feelings that it associates with the past. This chemical continuity fools the body into believing that it is still experiencing or re-experiencing the past. So the body keeps reliving the same emotional experience. When your memorized thoughts and feelings consistently force your body to be in the past, we could say that the body becomes the memory of the past. If those, so if those memorized feelings of betrayal have been driving your thoughts for years, then your body has been living in the past 24 hours seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. The same thing over and over and over again. In time, your body is anchored in the past. You know that when you repeatedly recreate the same emotions until you cannot think any greater than how you feel, your feelings are now the means of your thinking. And since your feelings are a record of previous experiences, you're thinking in the past. And by quantum law, 
you create more of the past. And it's you that are creating more of the past. Only you. It's not the environment around you that's creating it. It's you. That's the good news and the bad news. Bottom line, most of us live in the past and resist living in a new future. Why? The body is so habituated to memorizing the chemical records of our past experiences that it grows attached to these emotions. In a very real sense, we become addicted to those familiar feelings. So when we want to look to the future and dream of new vistas and bold landscapes in our not too distant reality, the body whose currency is feelings resist the sudden change in direction. Accomplishing this about face is the great labor of personal change. Many people struggle to create a new destiny, but find themselves unable to overcome the past memory of who they feel they are. Even if we crave unknown adventures and dream of new possibilities ahead in the future, we seem to be compelled to revisit the past. Feelings and emotions are not bad. They are the products of experience. But if we always relive the same ones, we can't embrace any new experiences. Have you known people who always seem to talk about the good old days? What they're really saying is nothing new is happening in my life to stimulate my feelings. Therefore, I'll have to reaffirm myself from some glorious moments in the past. I don't know, maybe you did something during the Olympics, you know, in the 80s or the 90s or 2000. That's a hundred failed relationships. And she was desperately alone. Such a sad situation. And she's unconscious. Just like, you know, there are many men out there who have had many, many, many relationships. One failed relationship after the other. They're the, they're the common denominator. All of us are the common denominator of any experience, any relationship we've ever had. And if you've had one failed relationship after the other, 10, 20, 30, 40, I don't care what the number is. Two, you are the common denominator. Who has to change? I have to be the one to change. For my life to take a turn for the better, I have to be the one to change. I don't have to control everything outside of me, everyone, everything, everywhere and every time. No, I just have to focus on me, change myself. Pay attention, starts here with me. When I change, everything else around me changes. And some people who are not suited for you, fall away, thank God. And then people who are better suited for you start to appear in your life. And better experiences start to appear in your life. You start to, it's like a magnet. Whatever it is that you're focus on, focusing on, you're a magnet, so you're gonna attract you're dwelling on the negative in the past, what was me, blah, blah, blah. You're going to be a magnet for those negative things. If you are in an unconditional loving state with yourself and you're centered and you're connecting with the divine on a daily basis, then you're going to magnetize yourself to really awesome, amazing, cool people, cool person, places, and things. Controlling our inner environment, the genetic myth more science behind this than you'd ever imagine so far and discussing 
how the quantum model of reality relates to change. I've spent most of the time talking about our emotions, the brain, and the body. We've seen that overcoming the reoccurring thoughts and feelings that the body memorizes is a must if we are to break the habit of being ourselves. Another major aspect of breaking this habit has to do with our physical health. Certainly in the hierarchy of things that most of us want to change about our lives, health issues rank way up there. And when it comes to what we'd like to change about our health, there is one set of dogmas that we're going to have to examine and dispel the myth that genes create disease and the fallacy of genetic determinism. We will also look at a scientific understanding that may be new to you called epigenetics, the control of genes from outside the cell, or more precisely, the study of changes in gene function that occur without the change in DNA sequence. Just as we can create new experiences for ourselves, like my daughter did, we can also gain control of a very important part of our lives that we commonly think of as our genetic destiny. As we go along, you will see that knowing something about your genes and what signals them to be expressed or not is crucial to understanding why you have to change from the inside out. Scientific dictum used to declare that our genes were responsible for most disease then a couple of decades ago. Okay, so scientific dictum used to declare that our genes were responsible for most disease. That's what we used to think. Then a couple of decades ago, the scientific community casually mentioned that they had been in error and announced that the environment by activating or deactivating particular genes is the most causative factor in producing disease. We know now, and we know, yeah, we now know that less than 5%, less than 5% of all diseases today stem from single cell gene disorders, such as Tay-Sachs, and Huntington's Korea, where around 95% of all diseases are related to lifestyle choices, chronic stress, and toxic factors in the environment. So those three things that were just mentioned are all outside of you. Lifestyle choices, chronic stress, and toxic factors in the environment. 95% of all illness are related to those, those three things. Yet factors in the outer environment are only part of the picture. What explains why two people can be exposed to the exact same toxic environmental conditions and one gets sick or diseased while the other doesn't? How is it that when someone has multiple personality disorder, one personality can demonstrate a severe allergy to something, while another personality in that same body can be immune to the same antigen or stimulus? Isn't that perplexing? Why, when most healthcare providers are exposed to pathogens on a daily basis, aren't doctors and other community members or others in the medical community continually ill? There are also numerous case studies documenting identical twins who share the same genes, who have had very different experiences when it came to their health and longevity. So for example, if both shared a family history of a particular disease, that illness often manifested in one twin, but not the other. Same genes, different outcome. In all cases, could the person who remains healthy have such a coherent, balanced, vital internal order that even when his or her body is exposed to the same hazardous environmental conditions, the external world does nothing to his or her gene expression and so doesn't signal the genes to create disease? It's true that the external environment influences our internal environment. However, by changing our internal state of being, can we overcome the effects of a stressful or toxic environment so that certain genes do not become activated? We may not be able to control all the conditions in our external environment, but we certainly have a choice in controlling our inner environment. Genes, memories of past environment. So to explain how we can control our inner environment, I need to talk a bit about the nature of genes 
which are expressed in the body when cells manufacture specific proteins, the building blocks of life. The body is a protein producing factory. Muscle cells make muscle proteins and are called actin or myosin and skin cells make skin proteins called collagen and elastin and stomach cells make stomach proteins called enzymes and most of the cells of the body make proteins and genes are the way we make that we make them so we express particular genes via certain cells making particular proteins the way most organisms adapt to conditions in their environment is through gradual genetic modifications so for example when an organism is faced with a tough environmental condition such as temperature extremes dangerous predators fast prey destructive winds strong currents and so on it is forced to overcome the adverse aspects of its world in order to survive as organisms record those experiences and wiring in their brains and the emotions in their bodies they will change over time. If lions are chasing prey that can, that can outrun them, then by actively engaging the same experiences for generations, they will develop longer legs, sharper teeth, or bigger hearts. All of these changes are the result of genes making proteins that modify the body to adapt to its environment. So let's stay with the animal worlds to look at how this works in terms of adaptation or evolution. A hypothetical group of mammals migrated to an environment in which the temperature ranged from 15 degrees to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The genes in those mammals over many generations of living under extremely cold conditions would eventually be triggered to produce a new protein which would produce thicker and greater amounts of fur. Hair and fur are proteins. So numerous insect species have evolved the ability to camouflage themselves and some that live in trees or other foliage have adapted to look like twigs or thorns, enabling them to escape the notice of birds. The chameleon is probably the best known of the camouflagers and it owes its color changing abilities to the genetic expressions of proteins. And these processes, genes encode the conditions of the external world. That's evolution, right? Epigenetics suggests that we can signal our genes to rewrite our future. So our genes are as changeable as our brains. The latest research in genetics shows that different genes are activated at different times. They are always in flux and being influenced. There are experience dependent genes that are activated when there is growth healing or learning and there are behavioral state dependent genes that are influenced during stress emotional arousal or dreaming so one of the most active areas of research today is epigenetics literally above genetics the study of how the environment controls gene activity epigenetics flies in the face of conventional genetic model, which stated that DNA controls all of life and that all gene expression takes place inside the cell. This old understanding doomed us to predictable future. Yeah, this old understanding doomed us to a predictable future in which our destiny fell prey to our genetic inheritance and all cellular life was predetermined like an automatic ghost in the machine. In fact, epigenetic changes in DNA expression can be passed on to future generations. But how do they get passed on if the DNA code stays the same? While a scientific explanation is beyond the scope of this book, we can use an analogy. Let's compare a genetic sequence to a blueprint. Imagine that you start with a blueprint for a house and you scan it into your computer. Then using Photoshop, you could alter its appearance on the screen, changing a number of characteristics without changing the blueprint. For example, you could change the expression of variables such as color, size, scale, dimensions, materials, and so forth. Thousands of people representing environmental variables could produce different images but they would all be expressions of that same blueprint. 
epigenetics empowers us to think about change more profoundly. The epigenetic paradigm shift gives us free will to activate our own gene activity and modify our genetic destiny. So for the sake of example and simplification, when I talk about activating a gene by expressing it in different ways, I will refer to turning it on. In reality, genes don't turn on or off. They are activated by chemical signals and they express themselves in specific ways by making various proteins. Just by changing our thoughts, feelings, emotional reactions, and behaviors, for example, making healthier lifestyle choices with regard to nutrition and stress level, we send ourselves new signals. They express new proteins without changing the genetic blueprint. So while the DNA code stays the same, once a cell is activated in a new way by new information, the cell can create thousands of variations of the same gene. We can signal our genes to rewrite our future. So perpetuating old states of being sets us up for an undesirable genetic destiny. So just as certain areas of the brain are hardwired, whereas other areas are more plastic, able to be changed by learning and experience, I believe genes are the same way. There are certain parts of our genetics that are more easily turned on, while other genetic sequences are somewhat more hardwired, which means they are harder to activate because they have been around longer in our genetic history. At least that's what science says right now. How do we keep certain genes turned on and others off? If we stay in the same toxic state of anger, the same melancholy state of depression, the same vigilant state of anxiety, or the same low state of unworthiness, those redundant chemical signals we have talked about keep pushing the same genetic buttons, which ultimately cause the activation of certain diseases. Stress, stressful emotions, as you will learn, actually pull the genetic trigger, dysregulating the cells. Dysregulation refers to impairment of a physiological regulatory mechanism and creating disease. So when we think and feel in the same ways for most of our lives and memorize familiar states of being, our internal chemical state keeps activating the same genes, meaning that we keep making the same proteins. Make no mistakes, our body produces 140,000 proteins and chemicals. That is what signals our autonomic nervous system to go to our DNA to create whatever proteins are required to be in a certain state. That's what we're gonna be signaling in order to create a new body and a new mind. But the body cannot adapt to these repeated demands and it begins to break down. If we do that for 10 or 20 years, the genes begin to wear out and they start making a cheaper protein. What do I mean? Think about what happens when we age, our skin sags, because it's collagen and elastin come to be made of cheaper proteins. What happens to our muscles? They atrophy. Well, no surprise, no surprise there. Actin and myosin too are proteins. Here's an analogy. When a metal part for your car is manufactured, it is produced in a dye or a mold. Each time that mold or dye is used, it is subjected to certain forces including a heat and friction, which begin to wear it down. As you might guess, car parts are built to very close tolerances, referring to the permitted variation in a workpiece's dimension. Over time, that dire mold wears to the point that it produces parts that won't fit properly to other parts. So that is similar to what happens to the body. As a result of stress or a habit of being repeatedly or consistently angry, fearful, sad, or so and so on, the DNA that that peptide used to produce proteins will start to malfunction. What is the genetic impact if we stay in routine, familiar conditions, creating the same emotional reactions by doing the same things, thinking the same thoughts, seeing the same people, and memorizing our lives into a predictable pattern? We are now headed for an undesirable genetic destiny. We are locked into the same patterns as generations before us. 
which confronted the same or similar situations. And if we are only reliving our emotional memories of our past, then we are headed for a predictable end. Our bodies will begin to create the same genetic conditions that previous generations faced. The body will stay the same as long as we are feeling the same way day in, day out. And as science tells us that it is the environment that signals the genes involved in evolution, what if our environment never changes? What if we've memorized the same conditions in our outer world and we're living by the same thoughts, behaviors, and feelings? What if everything in our lives stays the same? You've just learned that the external environment chemically signals genes through the emotions of experience. So if the experiences in your life aren't changing, the chemical signals going to your genes aren't changing either. No new information from the outer world is reaching your cells. So the quantum model asserts that we can signal the body emotionally and begin to alter a chain of genetic events without first having any actual physical experience that correlates to that emotion. We don't need to win the race, the lottery or the promotion before we experience the emotions of those events. Remember, we can, we can create an emotion by thought alone. We can experience joy or gratitude ahead of the environment to such an extent that the body begins to believe that it is already in that event. So as a result, we can signal our genes to make new proteins to change our bodies to be ahead of the present environment. Okay, we're going to stop here in this chapter and we'll continue tomorrow with the remaining balance of this chapter three. It's we're at two and a half hours and it's going to take a long time to render this information. So we're going to stop right here at this point in time. We are on page, just to let you know, we are on page 80. So we'll pick up on page 80 tomorrow night. Thank you for tuning in, tapping and turning on to Love and Memory Secrets TV. I really appreciate your being here today to breaking the habit of becoming yourself, learning, reading, reviewing, and applying the principles that are in this book. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to tune in and make a comment below in the questions on YouTube. If you want to private message me, you can go to my Instagram account and on Instagram, you can send me a private message or on Facebook, pick your poison, whichever one you would like. And if you are implementing any of these practices and you're starting to see results in your life in any way, shape or form, if you're starting to become aware of perhaps the feelings of guilt, you know, like I shared with you, my personal experience, or perhaps, a, you know, a language pattern, maybe you have a, a bad habit of saying a bad word all the time, or in my case, I was saying, oh God, oh God, oh God, umpteen times an hour. It took me four, almost five months to get rid of that habit. It was very eye-opening for me to see what a huge energy leak that was. And I was doing it in three, almost four languages. So um, yeah, and then I remember having specific conversations with people about it. And they would say to me, yeah, yeah, we thought it was kind of strange that you did that, but so I'm going to say ciao for now. If you haven't been affected by Go Love 20, if you don't know what Go Love 20 is, then the answer is no. You haven't been affected by Go Love 20. I would be overjoyed to be the one to affect you with Go Love 20. Just let me know through the comments here, and I will be immediately on it, like white on ride. So until then, ciao for now.